So in that kind of uh, close to free particle situation, you can use these basic questions. That's how they were used. People who knew they're all clever. They knew all these things. But they found there's a temporary place to use that without having to worry about how do I find an equation where I let the number of particles change. Where the can't be done by equation. So it works. These relative wave equations are not totally useless. They are useful. They're constantly used. The Dirac equation is constantly used for calculating relativistic corrections in atomic physics. Where the energies are such that electron positron pair production is very unlikely. So to handle fully relativistic quantum physics connecting correctly, one has to use some larger mathematics than uh, differential equations. That's what I should turn and look at the blackboard. Go. But is Japan? Is he on? Yes. 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 So quantum field theory is the answer. It provides a mathematical structure where it's a quantum theory. So it has wave functions, it has states, uh, the states linear combinations can be formed, constructive, destructive, which all that can happen. <coughs> But it's a structure where the states consist of arbitrary numbers of R1. So you're not describing the states by psi of R1 up to R18, because that's only 18 particles. So it's something more complicated. But there are states, and we'll come to this a little bit about that, where particle numbers can change. But the proper way to view quantum field theory, there is a more interesting way of realizing why quantum field theory is necessary, not because it solved the relativity marriage to quantum mechanics problem, but because it is a quantum theory of waves. Now this is something which you can appreciate, because you are told ever since in <coughs> school that in quantum theory there is great particle duality all over the place you have. Which means sometimes it's particles, sometimes it's waves and so forth. When you begin to be serious students of physics, where do you study this business? You study, take a quantum mechanics course, you start with electrons, which you think of as particles. And sure enough, there is some kind of a wave behavior we study. That's the wave function, which can interfere. Particles can accumulate in some place, the maximum, minimum, diffraction factors. So you see the wave-like behavior of particles. And that is studied in their course through the wave function. But the other side of the story, where the things that you thought of as waves have a particle-like behavior, you never study in your course. Remember that. Although it's promised from the very beginning, duality, particles can be waves, waves can be particles. But you only study one half of this question. So convention, traditional waves can have a particle-like behavior, something you hear about. In fact, photon is one of the first thing we hear. There was standard or something. Photoelectric effect. Photon is an ordinary light behaves like particles, and you can get through MSC in quantum mechanics, you never learn anywhere. Why when, how did light become photon? Unless you take a course on so this is something to bear in mind, and quantum field theory is, is actually the answer to that question. It is, it is the method for quantizing what you think of as waves. Just like your non-relativistic quantum mechanics was a way of quantizing what we thought of as particles and found that it has a wave behavior. Similarly, you can quantize using the same principles of quantum mechanics, waves, and you find it as particle like behavior. I can't show that to you, that's what comes at the end of many months of pain in the quantum field theory course. That will be some sketchy idea. Right. <coughs> Started at 10 past 5, so this is not much nice. So, just this you can So, in a non relativistic quantum courses, you never learn how or why light behaves like photons. Worse still, they also conveniently don't tell you. Hey, there's something I haven't taught you yet. Why light behaves like photon? Please don't think that you've been it. They don't never tell you that, even in the books. So you come up with you know, quantum mechanics teaching. Yeah. Half of that you've not done, of what you were promised in school. 
what are we truly deal with that? Of course, you don't learn it in particular, it's more complicated. But the fact remains that the very important part of question could ask, the school could ask, what happened to that part? And you can't be taught. So the theory that does that is quantum theory, where you do same principles for particles to start with things which are coordinate, and you quantize it by setting momentum position to the operator, whatever, 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 and find you entertaining waves that we Here you have to do the same thing, you have to quantize waves. Sometimes quantum theory is called second quantization. That is a bad, stupid misnomer. You don't quantize one, then you quantize again. It was the Kabi So you never quantize twice. That's a bad language. We know why the language came. You quantize only once. It's a question of what you're quantizing. You're quantizing non-relativistic quantum particles. You're quantizing strings. You're quantizing waves. It's only you quantize only once. Or you don't quantize. It's classical physics and quantum physics. There's no double to quantum physics. So, we are going to quantize, therefore, what we pick up in normal waves. What does that mean? Now, some waves are non-relativistic, like sound. Some waves are relativistic, like sound. <coughs> and you can quantize both, each one. Sometimes sound in some sense is a phonon. Uh, you go tang. You know. And if you quantize relativistic waves, of which like electromagnetic waves are an example, you know Maxwell's equation plus Lorentz invariant. Anyway, light travels at the speed of light. So, uh, you can have relativistic classical waves in classical E and M's and our familiarity with electric field, magnetic field. If you quantize those, you'll get a relativistic field theory. So, you can have non relativistic field theory, relativistic field theories, and the relativistic field theory will be a relativistic quantum theory. It will be consistent and will obey the combined principles of relativity and quantum mechanics. So, it does that job also. All you have to do is take a relativistic wave system and quantize it. The word field, by the way, is just another word in the generalized sense of what we call waves. Waves we think of as going in nice tiny sort of motion, but if the water jumping up and down all over, that's also a wave. And therefore, anything which is a disturbance of function of space and time can be called a wave or a field. So field theory is just essentially quantum wave theory. When you find that you quantize the waves, like if you take an electromagnetic system and quantize it, uh, you will find that like any quantum system, it's got energy levels. In quantum mechanics, you are not allowed every energy. The hydrogen atom can have these certain energies. There are these energy levels. You will find that when you quantize wave systems, instead of having arbitrary intensity of light you can have, E field classically can be anything, B field can be anything. When you quantize it, these things cannot be anything. They can only have certain values, and the energies in particular, come out in little steps, in packages. And those packages are put on. Can say a little bit more about it. A bit like a sketch how that happens quickly. Now, it's very useful to consider just this. I'll give us, take the simplest example of a wave, quantize it. And as a preview, just recall for you ordinary quantum mechanics. One particle, one degree of freedom, as we say. Particles are going to cause greater coordinates as Q. I won't use x because x I have for some other purpose. Q is the coordinate, p is the momentum, p is n q dot, dot is time derivative. So, and these are equations, you know, the equation of motion is that of the Harman oscillator. Two dot dot is omega square q square, Hamiltonian is p square by two m, etc. You quantize this in classical physics, q and p can have any values, so the whole story can be said. Whereas in quantum mechanics, these are not values but operators, you can apply them on wave functions to get physical answers, and the operators for Q, and the operators for V, P, for commute, and the commutator psi H bar. So you take Qs and Ps, not to be numbers, but to the operators, and you rework the theory to get quantum theory. Quantum theory is basically the process of quantization is taking those classical variables and converting them as operators, which operate on some space of states, wave function, and the commutation group will be the basic coordinates and its conjugate momentum is IH bar. When you do that for the harmonic oscillator, you work it all out, you get energy levels, which are n plus r, h bar omega. That's the best I'm able to do for h bar. <laughs> so this is one dimensional harmonic oscillator, just reminding you. In fact, you will find a simple wave being just like this. The simple wave, the simplest of the kind I'll show you now, is in fact a collection of harmonic oscillators. So let me just, a couple of slides.
slides here are a little bit equations. So here is, uh, uh, very quickly, let's consider now a wave, or a field, I call it a field. A field is something, a wave is something which has a value at every uh, point in space. Let me call it capital phi. So think about a wave going on a string and plug a violin string or something. At every place there's a displacement, and displacement is a function of x, and the displacement also changes with time. So the value of the displacement, which I call phi, at x will change with time. This function of x What are the coordinates here? The value of phi at every x is a coordinate. Dynamical coordinate. It's not the coordinate in the sense of x, y, z. Phi is the, in the classical mechanical sense, the coordinate. It's the object whose time evolution you're trying to get. It's the object in which you're interested. What will the wave look like 10 minutes after I plug the stone? What will the water wave look like after I drop the stone? So what you're looking for is the height of displacement. So that height of displacement is the dynamical variable you're interested in, and the coordinate therefore is the value of phi at every x. How many coordinates do I have? I have an infinite number of coordinates. I need to know infinite number of things to know the hardness of the string. It's not just one number for a particle. If I know it's here, I just have to give x, y, z. I know what it's doing that time, and it's the object. Here I have to give infinite number of numbers. Phi here, phi there, phi there, phi there. Phi there. So it's a system with infinite number of coordinates called phi of x, and they all vary with that. So this is the sort of dynamical status of what, what the displacement variable is. And I'm taking a simple wave equation this one. Second order in time, second order in space, and some constant for the constant. This is a simple equation for some property that we want. You can use these methods for more complicated. What is Maxwell's equation? More complicated than this. There's E field and B field. There are six of them, all if you want to use the so called vector potential. There are three uh, vector potentials A, and then there's these potential A, scalar potential phi, four variables there. So there are a lot more variables there. They are all connected to each other. Curl E is equal to D, 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 D curl B is equal to that. So it's a much more complicated system. But again, the system works. Now, to look at this equation, let's quickly run through the proof. And this, this, this proof will go so fast that if you come see it, just don't want really wait for this thing to be over two minutes this time will be done. Fourier and the Fourier expands that variable. That case are the Fourier coefficients, and there's an inversion for the Fourier expansion. You see all this. Now, the F k is for different k's, carrying the same information as phi x for different x's. If you know F k for all the k's, you can construct phi x. Conversely, if you know phi x for all of x's, using this formula you can find fk. So fk's and phi x are equivalent ways of describing the state. One is in terms of Fourier components, the other is in terms of actual displacement. So this is like making the linear combination. fk is nothing but some kind of linear combination of the coordinates. Because phi of x at each x is a coordinate, and you're summing over all the x's with some three factors, so it's like a1, q1, to a2, q2. So this is like an automated linear function. <coughs> so let us consider making a change of variable from all the phi of x's which are infinitely in number to the f of k which are also infinitely in number. And the advantage of that is that when you go to f of k, this equation becomes simple. Uh, if you substitute, then you will find d squared power by dt squared become f double dot, double dot is time derivative. Plug that into this. Take f double dot, and you look at phi double dot. And L square phi, d by d square x square phi, just becomes k square phi. Put second derivative here, that's just three minus k square. So this equation here, when written in terms of the fk's instead of the phi x's, looks like this. It's for any given k, it's an ordinary second order differential equation. In fact, it's a differential equation with exactly that of a harmonic system. Coordinate double dot plus some constant times the coordinate equal to zero. given that equation, and the rest is just form. So here is a harmonic oscillator. You know that when you quantize the system, by whatever way you quantize it, it will give you energy levels. The energy levels will be n plus half h for omega. What is omega? Omega is what, omega square is what comes there 
in the harmonic oscillator due to the t square of squares. So when you do that, omega k is just the, the square root, by the way, goes all the way. I spent hours trying to stretch it. <laughs> but this is omega k. So h bar omega k is h bar times this stuff. Bringing the h bars inside the squares and so forth and so on. Write h bar k as the momentum growth or any quantum mechanics association. You get t square, t square, plus n square, c fourth, m is just the name for this particular combination. And this is in fact the energy of the electric energy of a particle. Now this is a little heavy, I know, but in two slides we have done it. At 10 more minutes, it will go slower. So what can you find? You find that a wave equation like that one, uh, this equation, when you want that, well, actually it's like a direction of harmonic oscillator, infinitely many harmonic oscillators. You can never have a finite number of degrees of freedom by changing variables. You always have the same numbers. If you go from x, y, z to r, theta, phi, you still have to be. So, you still have an infinite number of variables, but these are different, more convenient variables where all their case decouple and each has its own separate equation, which is a familiar simple harmonic oscillator. Then you know when you quantize it, this will give you h bar omega k. And that is what it does. But more interesting is that h bar omega k has the formula for uh, the relativistic equation for a particle. So what is this harmonic oscillator at a given k? What are the levels? Well, n equal to 0, okay, that's the lowest level. After that, that's considered part of the vacuum. But n equal to 1 will be h bar omega more. And that's exactly like adding the energy of a particle of momentum e in mass m. Second excited level will be 2 of these guys. So that's the 2 particle state. Third level will be 3 particle state. So this system will produce for you 1 particle, 2 particle, 3 particle, 4 particle states, any number you like. At every moment at k, this is for each k, you change k, you have a different harmonic oscillator. And again, that is energy. So these are like photons of different frequencies, and the energy will come in packets. One photon works, two photons work, three photons work, never one and a half photon, never anything in between. The energy is quantized, that's what happens. Quantum mechanics, and the energy formula is that of a particle. And there are many, many other ways in which this particle can go into that. So this is how it happens. And quantum electrodynamics is the first. That what I gave you is a toy in field theory. That's a good one. Uh, a more realistic one is of course Maxwell's equation. And that, that was part of quantum electrodynamics. So the greatest theory in physics, it, and it allows for you states which have arbitrary number of electrons, positrons, and photons. It can deal with any number of electrons, can deal with electron positron creation, ionization, <coughs> emission of photons, photons that were not there will come out, and so on. All that can be handled because the theory contains in its states with any number of electrons, any number of positrons, any number of photons. You can consider transition matrix element going from two electrons to two electrons plus electron to positron. They are both states. And there will be some way by which one can go to the other by applying an external force. It's the most, I say perhaps I have seen it's really true, the most accurate theory, I should not uh, if it is or not, most accurate theory in all of science as far as I know, at least with experiments, 10 to the minus 9. Now some people jump up and down and say quantum R effect does that too, but quantum R effect doesn't have a theory. Phenomena, and I was in it a long time. It doesn't have a back Here you start with ohm, start with the back of Derive everything, and you get this answer to an accuracy of 10 to the minus 9. There are other field theories subsequently which will model out to me, all the non engaged theories, theory, Yandian theory, Salam, Weinberg, all those things, QCD, are all generalized versions. Now, the problem with QED is it cannot be solved exactly. It has interaction between electrons and electrons. We can't even solve an anharmonic oscillator in one dimensional quantum mechanics exactly. We can use perturbation theory or computer. If QED is used perturbation theory, and you get these numbers accurate to nine places in decimal, which agrees with the experiment, the magnetic moment of the, of the new meson, agrees with the experiment to nine places by doing perturbation theory. But in the process, you find that you're flirting with infinity. You get an answer that's infinity. Now, if you were weak hearted, you'd drop the whole thing and go home. But these are tough guys. They sat with the infinity, beat it to death, till they got a finite answer. And that's called the theory of denominalization. We don't have the time to discuss that. What happens is that in the course of the calculation, you run into answers that are infinity. For physical things, charge of the electron come out infinity. Mass of the electron come out infinity. 
So people had to 